Okay, so your book, uh, again, broke theropods up into three separate chapters, right? There's the theropods taken as a whole, and it especially targets large non-bird-like theropods, right? That the the largest and the most dinosaur of the of the bird-like animals, right? And then it takes birds and it treats them very separately, and it talks about how we know that they're nested within dinosaurs, but also uh, the pieces that lead to that. And this third chapter of that series is really about how do we get from relatively uh, primitive flyers to the full-on flyers of aves. And we're going to stop almost immediately after arriving at aves, which is modern birds, because that really is a, a separate branch, and we're not going to talk about that. But I also included here the paleonathans. Paleonathans are uh, a primitive or the most what we call primitive or basal lineage within modern aves today. And of course, if they're basal, they should retain characteristics of uh, uh, the relationship to more, to more primitive animals. And so they should share, at least to some degree, some of those characteristics. And so I think it's important to at least look at those before we leave them. This, of course, is bird-like, but this is not a modern bird. And this is going to be the sort of key for today. The birds that you see, uh, if you call them that, are going to look a lot like birds that we think about, but they're going to have really distinct differences if you can just look under the hood, right? If you can just lift up the hood and look underneath it. This one's fairly obvious right off the bat. There's not really a very distinct beak on this one like we think of with modern birds. And of course, even more obviously, there's lots of teeth. Question? Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't worry. If I call on you, you don't have a question. That's fine. So when we look at Archaeopteryx, and you saw a cast of that at the museum, right? So we, we got to see at least a little bit. We got to look at some of the traits that were advanced, things like these relatively long arms. Not as long as modern birds, but they're relatively long. Um, lots of feathers, and especially an important advanced trait, asymmetrical feathers, right? That was also contained. But there's also a lot of primitive traits that we saw, things like a relatively uh, large number of teeth, right? Modern birds don't have teeth and a very, very long tail. Those are, uh, those are some other characteristics. But we have a little bit further to go now because there were a lot of lineages that arose post Archaeopteryx and prior to Aves. And we're going to at least look at some of them to give you an idea about the trends that have, have been following uh, small theropod evolution through time. And especially this lineage, because this lineage appears to be dominated by the, uh, the insistence on I increased uh, flight characteristics, right? So birds and their relatives, at least when you get close to them, really are, in general, specialists in flight. And they do a lot of things to become better and better at it. So by and large, evolution is driven in that way. Now, that's not entirely true. There are some members that lose the ability to fly and some members that specialize in different ways. But Overall, there's a, there's a uh, strong trend towards better flyers. So one of the things I didn't talk about yet with Archaeopteryx is we can also measure the rate at which it grows. Now, we are going to talk about growth within dinosaurs later, but I have already told you about some of the growth rates, right? And we have talked at least a little bit about the age of animals. And certainly, you should know at least something about bird growth rates. So look at the chart on the left here. I've already given you the punchline. They do grow more slowly. But on the left, what you're looking at is the known Archaeopteryx specimens placed onto a growth curve. So we know approximately how old these animals are. And what, let's see, this is the one we looked at. And that animal uh, is falls right in the middle with a lot of other known specimens. And how old is that animal in years, roughly? The one that we looked at very closely. Yeah, it's probably almost about a year old. And you can see a couple of things. One, it's not really uh, that large yet, right, compared to how big it will get. And two, it's, still gro it's actually growing exponentially at that point. In fact, you can see that we have a lot of these specimens mixed in here at the exponential growth, and that may be because when you reach those exponential growth periods, if you don't have access to food, you're likely to die in those cases, right, because you need to be packing on weight. Uh, but it could just be uh, 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 probability of capture. In any case, uh, what I want you to note is, one, that these animals take a long time to reach maturity. How old is an animal up here? Yeah, it's probably, two, this is about two and a half to three years old, so the animals are approaching three years old. 
And the other thing is that when you're young, right, you're not growing that fast. You're growing, but you're not growing that fast. Now, what do modern birds do? How are they different? How do modern birds grow? Moderately. They grow moderately fast? fast? They grow really fast, right? So if you think about it, what happens when uh, uh, chicks are in the nest, right? If you see chicks in the nest, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen parents taking care of birds, we used to have a bird that nested next to us uh, every year in my one house. My one house, <laughs> like I had many houses. <laughs> at my house before we moved. Um, and we used to have a bird that nested. And what happens is you get chicks, which are relatively undeveloped. They grow extremely fast, right? And within a few weeks, they're already starting to do things like fledge. And as soon as they're fledged, they're gone. And they're fully grown at that point. So the speed of growth is very, very high. And you know that, and we've taken advantage of that because we have things like industrial chickens. What's the advantage of chickens? Well, chickens don't spend any energy on reproduction early, and they do lots of growth, and they grow really quickly. So you can grow meat really, really fast on chickens, right? That's the great thing about industrial chickens. You put in food, and within a few weeks, you're starting to get money back, right? You, they come out to the slaughterhouse fast. Animals like Archaeopteryx would not have been like that. This is an animal that, to get it to fully adult size, you would need at least two years of growth. And so that is a slow animal. That is far more characteristic of dinosaurs as we think of. That's not super slow. It's not slow like uh, many, uh, many lizards that we think of. But it's slow relative to modern birds. Birds are different, right? And I've told you that birds have really evolved to take care of becoming better flyers. What's the advantage of growing really, really fast if you're a bird? And it relates to flight. You learn how to fly. You can fly earlier, right? And so you can get out of the nest and start to live faster in that way. If you spend a long period of time as a uh, juvenile in that way, you're going to have relatively weak flying characteristics for a long time, right? Chicks are not good flyers. You want to be the adult animal. And so that means that if you can truncate the period at which you're very vulnerable and you can't go very far, the, that gives you opportunities faster outside the nest. But it comes at a great cost, right? There's a real risk to growing fast, and that is if you don't get food, you die almost immediately. And that is if you have ever tried to raise chicks, they can be uh, fairly finicky in that way. There are many different strategies for modern birds, uh, and of course some modern birds don't even fly, uh, in fact. So the, the strategies for parental care are variable. Some just brood a a eggs, and then as soon as they hatch, basically they're almost gone. Um, some are uh, doing things where there is a long period of parental care, but there are extremely long periods where the parent isn't around the chick. You can think of things like penguins, right? They are there for uh, when the egg is brooding and when the, the, the offspring is small. As soon as it gets large enough, the parents may still interact very closely with that offspring, but they spend a really long time away from it, and the offspring just waits for their return in that way. Uh, that's also characteristic of things like seabirds as well, where the chick may spend long periods of time waiting for a parent, even though they're being fairly well protected. And then some, of course, spend lots of time, and almost all of their time right around the chick until the chick is large enough to leave. And you can think of things like ostriches. They protect their chicks up until the, the animal is quite large, and then that, that animal leaves. So it's variable, so I won't say one or the other. When we're dealing with birds especially, you're dealing with a huge range of species. And the other thing is they are not – there's so many different kinds of species. There's th species that are predatory. There's species that are herbivorous. There's species that are omnivorous. There are ones that are long flyers and short flyers and, and ground-oriented. So there's a lot of strategies that come into play at that point. So if we look at things like Archaeopteryx, right, uh, what you can see down here is that uh, this M is, the, is mammal growth, and then there's altricial birds, um, and then um, uh, P is what? That's the precocial birds, yeah, that are growing, and that is that line. Um, and so altricial birds are here, precocial birds are down there. And what you can see is that Archaeopteryx falls out below precocial birds and below, of course, below altricial birds, but much, much higher than what we think of for reptiles. So it's halfway between, right? It's, an in the, it, it, it's that moderate step where evolution is picking up pieces, and as it does that, it's trending in one direction. But you don't see that till you zoom all the way out. When you look at it, at, when you zoom in on that one point, 
it doesn't necessarily give you that information. The other thing about Archaeopteryx is it's relatively a large animal, right? That's a big, that's a fairly large animal uh, for a bird-like thing. Archaeopteryx is also unusual, we didn't talk about this last time either, in that it has a fairly well-developed sense of smell. Modern birds, by and large, have given up the sense of smell. They do have it, but it's not nearly as well-developed, and again, that's, that's probably reflective of uh, a, a lack of use of that relative to, to other elements that are more important and the need to save space. And you can also even see how the brain is arranged within the skull and how the brain is accommodated within the skull. And of course, Archaeopteryx is also uh, much, much smaller in size for its brain relative to an equally sized bird in that way. So Archaeopteryx is smart relative to, again, what we think of as reptiles, but it's dumb relative to what we think of as modern birds. It's, a moder it's that, that very middle of the road um, transitional step where we're getting some of those elements added on. And the other thing is that modern birds are, have really well-developed senses of sight, which of course would be really important if you're flying around and using sight to help guide you. And Archaeopteryx has some of that, but again, not nearly as well developed. And again, that would make sense based on what we know about it. And I mentioned to you before that it's, it's able to fly to probably to some degree, but very weakly so, and probably for only very short periods of time. It just simply would not have had the muscle development to do really long periods of, of active flying. So this is also a question that people bring up fairly um, uh, frequently now, is, is Archaeopteryx a bird? Well, Archaeopteryx, remember when we think of the relatedness of animals to each other, there's a, there is a line, and at some point we're trying to put boxes on the line, right? And usually we're lucky enough that we don't have very many pieces on the line, so it looks like a series of points, and sometimes the points are clustered closely together, and when that happens we say, well, that's a group. Right? That, that makes sense. Those are a group of animals. Uh, that are related to one another. But really, it is a line. It is a long series of individuals that are related to one another, and they all intermingle at some point. There's a shared relationship between them. Certainly, Archaeopteryx is not part of Aves. It is absolutely not part of the clade that we think of as modern birds. It is similar um, to at least species that gave rise to modern birds, but it's unclear if we actually know if it's related to the, the exact lineage that gives rise to modern birds. So we can talk about uh, uh, trends in the evolution in birds and what might they be. What are some trends that we've seen in, in modern birds that make it different from Archaeopteryx? Loss of teeth. Loss of teeth? Uh, the, the, well, the, the modification of the teeth. Yep, a modification of the, the beak instead of teeth. What else? I just mentioned two other ones. Um, they have a strong sense of smell. Strong sense of smell in Archaeopteryx and what's in modern birds? Not as strong, and what did they develop instead? Sight. Sight. Yep. Uh, increased growth rate. Increased growth rate. Yep. Good. What else have have modern birds done? Reduced tail. Reduced tail and modified it into something very different. Yep. So very reduced tail, and now there's a small bone at the end. Um, increased flight. Increased flight power, and how do they do that? Um, what fuses? Hind legs are important, and there are bones that are fusing in the legs, but specifically for flight musculature, what is changing within the body? The breastbone is, is, is being produced, right? So it's a fusion of the gastralia into a solid component, and then a keel that appears off of that so that muscles have a firm place to attach to. Uh, and then uh, what are some other things in, in bird evolution as well? These you may not get as quickly. How about the number of bones within the body? decreases considerably, uh, both in the neck and especially along the back. So the, the back of birds is, uh, has, a, it has a relatively few number of vertebrae relative to the primitive condition, and that makes sense. The bird does not want to be uh, extremely flexible in body, and it also wants to save weight, so reduction of those elements to save uh, weight in that way. There's also a few others, and we're going to step through those today. So animals, when they evolve to become flying animals, have to make a lot of, of very large sacrifices to do so. Flight is really hard to do. It is extremely uncommon. It is one of the most uncommon things to evolve within animals. Uh, it has, if you think about it, vertebrates have done it three times, uh, and only three times. 
And in all the rest of the animal kingdom, there is one other group that evolved flight, and that is the insects. Right? And probably in all of those cases, that evolved once. So insects, even though they're extremely diverse, are probably all, all flighted insects are probably closely related to one another at some point. So that evolved probably just once. There's some debate about that, but as far as we can tell, it looks like it appeared just once. Flight works really well when you don't weigh very much, but that also means that um, to be a good flyer, uh, you need muscles, right? And so there's this real cost that you have to pay. So you really want nice, strong muscles to be able to fly because you have to push uh, material uh, down. You have to push as much air down. You have to force down as much energy as you need to lift up. And then you also need to force behind you the amount of energy you need to move forward. So there's a lot of energy that needs to be expended. Muscles are very heavy because muscles have the density of water. Water is relatively heavy. And of course, you know that if you put a droplet of water in the air, regardless of its size, it wants to fall to the ground, right? Even if you get really small droplets of water, they still want to fall down to the ground. The other problem for flight is that because you need these very high energy muscles, you have to have a very, very fast metabolism by and large. You must have a very fast metabolism because you need to generate energy very rapidly for muscles and you need to be able to scale it up very quickly. So when you're not flying, you need to have, um, a, still have to maintain a relatively high metabolism because when you go to fly, you need to have all of that energy ready. Right? So there's a real cost to that as well. And then another part for flight is for vertebrates especially, uh, you need to be at least somewhat intelligent to do this. You have to have some sort of brain power because controlling a large animal in flight is actually fairly difficult to do. Insects less so, uh, but they, they do have to pay a cost for flying as well. Uh, but intelligence is really important for large vertebrate flyers. So pterosaurs were relatively smarter than reptiles. Uh, than other reptiles that they're related to, and birds are relatively smarter than uh, the theropod dinosaurs that they are related to, and of course bats for their size are actually relatively intelligent, and you can train bats, right? They're actually not, uh, they're, they're fairly intelligent animals. And then ultimately what you end up with is a body that is going to be, usually it's going to be either really good at flying, or it's going to be really good at, at walking, right? It's, you, it's very hard to get access to a body that's good at both because often, for vertebrates anyway, we have to give up appendages and dedicate those to flight and spend the rest of the appendages or maybe access for mobility. And so animals like bats, for instance, are not terribly good at, at walking around. Uh, animals like pterosaurs were probably better, although again, they are limited in the degree of their locomotion compared to other quadrupeds. And birds are also fairly limited to a degree in their, in their uh, bipedal motion. And if you get birds that, for instance, like this albatross, that become uh, what we would say is sort of the, the peak of gliding, these are gliders, not flappers, um, these animals are actually uh, uh, extremely vulnerable on the ground, right? By being a great glider, they give up a lot of other things, not least of which is that they're not particularly stable on the ground, and they look really awkward on the ground. So they can only be in areas where predatory, they can only, I should say, land in areas where large predatory mammals are not able to access them easily because they would get picked off. It's very difficult for them uh, to get away from, from terrestrial animals, and they also need extremely long runways to take off, right? So that's a real cost for them. We're going to go through some of these, but you can just, at, at, at first glance, as a rule, the first thing that you can assume with birds is if that evolved in birds, it's probably a way to reduce weight for that animal and help it uh, conserve on the amount of basically water it would need within its body, right? Because weight is especially driven by that. Uh, the pigus style here is the reduction in the tail. We'll talk about that. The sensacrum is also developed. We're going to talk about the loss of vertebrae. We're going to talk about shoulder joints. And we're going to talk about, of course, the digits of the hands fusing as well, which you also know uh, at this point. So this is a grouping of birds with modern lineages and some extinct lineages. We're going to start up at the top because that's where the most primitive members of the group are. What you'll notice actually that Archaeopteryx actually falls out not at the highest level, right? So we're actually a little bit further in. These, the very top members are raptors that are, well, we would call them raptors, raptors that would be very, very well feathered and probably have very large uh, type 4 feathers but they will not be uh, animals that are probably a accessing flight as a use. They may be able to do some basic gliding. And then by the time we get down here, of course, there's modern lineages and you can start to recognize these silhouettes. And this weird dragonfly thing. 
So let's start, I think, yeah, so we, we already looked at Archaeopteryx up here, so we're going to start a little bit further into the tree. This is a group that is abundant in the Mesozoic, and this is actually a group that was abundant prior to uh, what we think of as modern birds. And this was actually the dominant group of birds for a long period of time. These are certainly flighted animals. They're not as good of flyers as ones that we see today, but these are certainly flyers. They apparently do terribly at the end of the Cretaceous, and we have no modern group make it through. And so I think one of the things that raises immediately is, uh, well, if flight alone is sufficient to provide uh, explanation for how animals survive the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, it's not sufficient to explain why these animals went extinct, right? So there's some questions about that as well. They also have, uh, they, they are a group that by at this point where folding of the, the wing very tightly in and against the body uh, to protect it while the animal is walking because the arm is now extremely long has evolved. Perching feet have evolved, so these animals are spending a lot of time in trees, right? So they need to, they will grasp the front of the branch with those first three toes and use the fourth digit like we have, an opposable thumb in that way, uh, to hold on to the branch securely so that they don't, they don't do the constant like turn and swing down to the bottom. So birds don't hang like bats. Uh, and then they also do this where they, they noticeably increase the size of that breastbone and that is going to start to provide the, the muscle access for them to provide power, really strong powered flight. Now they are, again, not as strong, but they are stronger. But they have some, some weird elements, again, of these primitive conditions that are left over. They still have gastrolia. Uh, they still have a very large number of vertebrae within the body, so the body is still relatively flexible. They do not have that tarso metatarsus that I talked about that modern birds did. They still have an unfused tarsus. Their pelvis retains a much more dinosaurian look to it. It looks much more like a modified Cerishian pelvis than the very unusually almost undefinable pelvis that you would see in birds, right? The pelvis you see in modern birds is an extremely modified version of a Cerishian pelvis. And these guys, of course, also had teeth, so they would have very much looked like feathered raptors that spend a lot of time in trees. This is an animal, it's hard to actually find good, um, good examples of these. This is Confuciosornis. This is an animal for which we have a lot of specimens for, and it's not actually part of the group that we are using here but it has many of the elements that, uh, we, that I wanted to show you. I wanted to, again, look at the number of vertebrae within the body. There's gastralia here. Uh, these uh, fingers uh, would have been fused, of course. The legs are not, again, not identical to modern birds, uh, but they're similar. You can start to see the reduction of bony elements within them. And the pelvis, especially, look at how different that pelvis is. That pelvis is not what we think of for modern birds, right? It looks like a Cerishian pelvis, with the pubic bone pulled backwards, which is, of course, what it is. It's a, it's a Cerishian pelvis with the pubic bone pulled backwards, but modern bird pelvises are far more complex than that, right? So this is a bit of a, a difference. And here you can see the tail is truncated, and certainly it is, but there's still many, many elements within it. There's a, fully, a fairly long tail in that way. So this is, a, this is a bird in transition in that way. And then also, look at the skull up here. If I gave you that skull, I suspect that many of you would place it immediately into the dinosaurians and into the theropods because it looks theropod-like. There are some elements that make you think, well, it's a little unusual, but the fusion of most of that space into basically open space with struts of bone surrounding it, again, to reduce weight, has not yet occurred, and the openings within the skulls, right, the, the classic diapsid opening, still remain there. Here's an animal that I did want you to see, but it's very similar in that way to the, the prior picture. But here again, the skull is, is starting to become bird-like in the way that we think about it, but it's still noticeably dinosaurian, right? It still retains what looks like uh, diapsid conditions, very modified in that way. But the body, again, retains all of those elements we talked about. Here again, the pubic bone is pulled backwards, but it's still noticeable, right? It's still obviously differentiated from the rest of that pelvis. All right, so let's look down a little bit further. This is a branch of, okay, so this group up here uh, goes extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, but some elements of this lower tier that I've selected right here do make it through. In fact, we think multiple different lineages made it through from this group. At least one of those, you can, what I just showed you there is, is a bunch of different things, right? One of the branches, Aves, and of the branch, Aves, multiple members made it through, but one does make it through. 
And these belong to a group, the or ornith, uh, ornith or Omorpha. And these are a group that are probably fairly well defined. We think that they have a lot of nice uniting characteristics. We'll find out that's the case as we get more and more fossils. Basically, at this point, if you were to look at them, and certainly if you were to look at their bones, it would be easy to start to mistake them for modern birds, by and large. They have a lot of elements that are uh, modern, in it, or at least what we think of as modern, and they look in many ways like modern birds, right? And they're probably spending a lot of time in general flying. Some of them, of course, are not pure flyers, and we have this today. Birds give up flight relatively quickly if there's no reason for it. Flight, again, is very, very expensive to do, and certainly very, very large birds are not going to be able to fly. Uh, if there's some upper limit to birds, but also very large birds require enormous amounts of power to fly, and so many of those larger animals give it up. So you can think of it like ostriches and the extinct moas gave up flight relatively quickly. This animal is a swimming bird. Again, it is on the, it is re more closely related than the other groups we looked at, and you can see that in the bones. There's some real differences here, including look how the gastralia have now fused into the, into this breastbone. Uh, but there's other weird things that aren't bird-like in that way, and that would be things like uh, the teeth right up here uh, at the top. Yes, so this lineage includes lots of members that didn't, but the one that did, Aves, of course, does belong to this group ah. in that way, right? So, the, of course, this, this group of animals, the one that this is closely associated with, did not make it through. But it is related in that way. And so we can actually, you might reconstruct it, it looks something like this. And you can see that the loss of arms, especially if you're not a flying animal, makes sense in this. We, we anticipated this because we've seen this happen many, many times in theropods. Theropods are very happy to modify both number of fingers and arm size very rapidly. So here it's just being modified yet again, and it's providing, in this case, uh, uh, a better swimming mode for this animal, right? So this is more like what we think of as a cormorant or a penguin-type animal. And so we should be a little bit careful about comparing it directly because this animal is not experiencing the same selective pressures that a lot of the animals that we're thinking about do, right? We're thinking a lot about flying animals, animals that spend a lot of time in trees, and this animal is spending a lot of time mostly submerged in the water and probably emerging only rarely, maybe to do things like breed or to rest in that way, and maybe not even just to rest. But I just want to show you pictures of it because we have them. Yeah, it, and it probably functions very similarly in the in environment. Does it have arms at all? It has, little tiny, it has little tiny stumpy arms <laughs> that are real tucked in there. Okay. For aves, anyway, we know that aves appears, and again, this is modern birds, appear sometime in the Cretaceous, and we think that they, the, at least a fossil record we have goes back to the late Cretaceous, which doesn't say very much because we think they evolved quite a bit earlier than that, but... Uh, the problem with these animals, of course, is remember the, the 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 bird fauna is not dominated by aves until after the KT extinction event. So they remain rare until after that event. They are also small, as far as we can tell. They are often uh, spending time in what we think are as forests, right? Because that's a, that's where probably a lot of them are. All of these things lead to really bad fossil preservation, and they also have relatively uh, they, remember, they have those pneumatic bones, so they're small and they're easily destroyed. And so these animals are not ever going to be common in the fossil record, and we will find more of them in the future, I have no doubt about that, but they will always be rare, and so we can't anticipate ever having a lot of them to deal with, unfortunately. It's not like when we deal sometimes with mammals, where we have a lot of members of a single species, sometimes in a single lo location. They are certainly diverse, so we know that they're at least diverse before the KT event, and then their diversity explodes after the KT event. And that's, again, probably because that niche space opens up and they're able to fill in with all of those locations. I'm not going to explain, or get, we're not going to guess that, I should say, why that is the case in the sense that why uh, they make it through the KT yet. Uh, but we will try to talk about that when we get to the Cretaceous tertiary extinction event, because it is important to recognize a lot of lineages actually do make it through the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, and is there some reason why that would be the case? Are there lineages that are resistant to extinction, and why might that be? Or certain types of extinction, and why might that be? 
So we've spent a lot of time looking at this chart, but I just want you to know that AVs probably appear somewhere uh, within the Cretaceous, maybe there, maybe not, but somewhere within the Cretaceous. And it will look like a modern animal at that point in many ways. Now it will not be, the, it's not that pigeons appeared in the Cretaceous and they are running around um, as smaller versions of pigeons, but they, the, the characteristics that make AVs that unite it as a group Things like the fusion of the pelvis uh, with the, vert the vertebrae, the reduction of the number of vertebrae, the fusion of gastrolia with the breastbone, the m complete and almost com uh, total loss of the tail, except for a very small element at the end, the modification of the pubic bone, uh, the uh, change in the skull morphology, all of that will now be, the, the, the fusion of bones within the leg, all of that will be set in the Cretaceous. So when you look at birds, uh, at least primitive members of the bird lineage, you're really looking at animals that probably evolved, uh, or that the members, uh, or I should say the lineages evolved in the Cretaceous and then have persisted through and diversified since then. So it's a fairly successful idea, right? No, I guess not idea. It's not like birds sit around the table and think of better ways to become flyers. It's a su fairly successful lineage in the way of, of uh, daytime flight, right? Birds are really good at it and they seem to have done well in that case. Avies, of course, picked up the development of a perching foot, which makes sense. We think they evolved especially around trees. They developed this pigo style. If that's at the end of the tail, that helps uh, uh, reduce the tail. And it produces, actually, the pin feathers on the back of a bird are still important for the bird in flight. And so it, produce, it retains the ability to use those in flight, which is useful. It does things like it reduces trunk vertebrae, de it develops these flexible furculi. I went through a lot of this stuff, so I'm not going to keep going through. Uh, uh, more and more of that material. Yeah, I'm not going to spend more time on this because it's covered in your book and we already talked about this fairly extensively. Oh, and then the loss of teeth. And of course, Aves, if you had seen them in the Cretaceous, would have not had teeth as well. So we know that Aves as a whole has lost uh, teeth relatively early again. So they're, they're losing teeth and then the uh, group is as we think of them. So AVs are not a group that has had teeth and then lost them. They're a group that evolved from an ancestor without teeth in that way. Modern AVs, this is a reconstruction of the modern group. What I want you to see here is, of course, there's lots of advanced groups up at the top of this tree, right? So if, as in this case, it doesn't matter if you start the tree on the bottom or the top. I keep reversing it because the authors don't care either, so they, they keep flipping it around, but I can't flip it back and forth easily because I don't have... I don't have this graphic in their program to do so, so you're just going to have to bear with me the fact that the trees start on the bottom or sometimes they start on the top. But there's lots of modern and advanced groups at the top, and look, there are many that you can think of that you would know, things like owls and eagles, falcons, uh, and, and all sorts of, uh, of other members up here, pelicans and herons as well. As you move down on the tree, right, we're moving down into members that are more basal, so they, must con they probably contain elements that are more similar to the common ancestor. And within that, you find things uh, that are in, that are interesting uh, and sometimes common things like waterfowl and landfowl actually fall within there, including chickens and turkeys are actually fairly basal. And if you've ever seen turkeys, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but at the very very bottom of the tree, there's a, two groups there that we don't really deal with in North America because we don't have them by and large. There's these um, tinaminiform tinamiaformes, which is uh, the tinamins. And then, of course, there's the struthios that are uh, ostriches, emus, cassowaries, and moas, and their relatives in that well. And what you can see here is these, if you can't see it, but you will if you look at the presentation later, the gray bars represent how uncertain we are about when those groups appeared. So things like ostriches uh, may have evolved after the KT event. That's possible. Probably not. They seem to have evolved well before the Cretaceous event. But the evolution of Aves is dated at about 100 million years ago, roughly. So Aves is a relatively deeply rooted tree within uh, the dinosaurs, and it was around for a long period of time, although, again, it would have been relatively rare compared to some of the other members. So the most basal lineage, the most primitive lineage of modern groups are these paleonathans. Paleonathans are unusual. I'm not going to, if you deal with Aves, you'll see this in the future, but their skulls are very unusual because they retain skull elements that are more similar to theropod dinosaurs than to modern groups that have largely gotten rid of those uh, struts within the skull to produce weight. 
but we're not going to, I'm not going to show you, I think I'm going to show you a picture of it, but unless you're a specialist, it's not going to make sense. You're just going to have to trust me on that. They do appear to possess a lot of traits which are primitive and that probably uh, their, even their lifestyle probably reflects something of the lifestyle which they've had for a long time. And then many, 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 many species within these groups, there aren't that many species, have lost flight or actually are poor flyers uh, as we think of them. Ostrich head, right? This is actually a fairly bony head. Now again, ostriches are unusual because they aren't flighted animals. So you have to be a little bit careful about saying, well, this is a head that, that reflects exactly how modern aves, or, uh, aves uh, would have looked like at the sort of the branching point. But what I do want you just to appreciate is that the head is far more solid than we think of uh, for, for uh, birds that spend a lot of time in the air. But there are some things that are characteristically different about this than theropod head, not least of which those uh, fenestra which are on the top and on the side of the head have already closed up, right? So that the diapsid condition is lost in that way, or at least the appearance of the diapsid condition is lost in that way. Ostrich emus and their allies, right, do not have flight. We are no very large flying ostriches or very small ostriches, although that would be adorable. Uh, but they are very powerful runners and very good runners at that. They don't run in exactly the same way as we think of that theropod dinosaurs ran, and that's because they don't have a, they don't have a big long tail off the back end, but it doesn't prevent them from being very, very powerful runners. They're just slightly modified in that way. At least these groups seem to lean towards herbivory. Uh, there is some omnivory evolved, and none of them as far as that are alive today are, are purely carnivorous, although that hasn't always been the case. Some of these members Im invaded islands and became top predators and actually displaced synapsids. So they were the, the top predator within those uh, locations again. So the MOAs, uh, after the KT extinction event, members of this uh, group were on islands in some cases, and they seemed to have this to uh, secure the top predatory niche in those cases. Again, filling out the theropods as the, as the top predator in many ecosystems. That, by and large, that doesn't appear to be true on, on, on uh, large continental lands where large synapsid bodies seem to have won out in those battles. Breeding for these guys, and the reason that all of this is interesting, right, the reason we're talking about their ecology is because their ecology, again, probably reflects to some degree the ecology of primitive basal uh, uh, groups that are close to aves but not quite so. And that may even give us insight into uh, advanced theropods, right? At least for these guys, they have usually have uh, uh, some sort of harem system. That's not always the case. Males will control harem. Sometimes males will guard the eggs alone. So cassowaries uh, will have females that lay, multiple females will lay eggs with one male, and then the male will guard those. And then all of them have parental care, which suggests that this is, probably the case also, and we anticipated this, that theropod dinosaurs probably also had a lot of parental care relative to what we think about with many other lineages of reptiles, and that again is not surprising because we know that their other nearest common ancestor, <coughs> crocodiles and alligators, also participate in actually a lot of parental care of the offspring. Usually there's some brooding, so the adult will brood the eggs, which again makes sense. The adult will, will warm the eggs, and that's why that the eggs are asymmetrical in birds. And then, uh, as we anticipated, based on the number of eggs that a dinosaur can produce, their large size and their rate of growth, mortality on chicks is extremely high. Right? In fact, getting to the point at which you hatch is an achievement for an ostrich or an emu. Most eggs don't even get a chance to hatch. Most of them get eaten. Uh, and then, uh, even if you make it to that point, you're still extremely vulnerable and likely to die before you get large enough uh, to even become an adult emu in that way, or an ostrich. Here's a picture of those guys. They have feathers that are, uh, they look probably superficially like some of the primitive feathers that were on, theropod di on, on primitive theropod dinosaurs. That's independently evolved because we know that they evolved from ancestors with flight. So the evolution of a more primitive looking feather is a secondary evolution of a, an advanced feathers. So we have to be a little bit careful about comparing their feathers directly. But I don't think we have to be as concerned about the appearance. Probably animals that are endothermic in that way and that have these bodies probably do need to fully insulate them by and large. And again, uh, they probably reflect, and, and they do appear to reflect based on our fossil evidence, 
something that looked similar to what theropod dinosaurs look like uh, as these as these groups were advancing into into birds. And you can see the very theropod foot, right? Very clearly a theropod foot on this animal. Also, these guys are adorable. These are kiwis, not the fruit, but the small bird. Kiwis are actually a dwarf moa. So moas were the giant predatory animal, predatory birds that lived on island. Kiwis are closely related to them. They are, in fact, they are in that group, but they are uh, diminished in size. So they are the small version of that. Moas filled out a lot of the different environments for feeding on different animals. Kiwis act. Uh, you can imagine these as bird mammals. They are uh, very mammal-like in the way they behave, but they are obviously birds. So they have weird things like they are nocturnal. They have these really long feathers on the face that it, so that they're basically whiskers. They are real stinky, and they have pretty bad eyesight. Again, there's a lot of these weird things. And then Kiwi's claim to fame is they produce the largest egg uh, per, for a bird or for any animal based on body size, uh, and it's something like 30 to 50 percent of the female's weight is an egg when she's brooding it. So it's an enormous amount of energy, and it sounds outrageous, but it turns out if you just scale moas down, if you just take a moa and scale it down, that egg doesn't scale down as fast, and the kiwi is exactly that problem. The moa is scaling down, but that egg ain't coming down with it, so you just get a really big moa egg in a little tiny bird, right? So that's, that's a problem for these guys. These guys are actually uh, somewhat endangered, and there's a number of species of them but they are very cool. This is the, I, I, I should say, the diversity within this group. This is what you can think of when you think of these groups. Uh, here are things like the moas, and you know things like the ostrich, the emu, and the cassowary over here. Cassowaries are actually really beautifully colored. I think we've already seen a picture of them. So the distribution of these guys is very interesting. These are all paleonathans. A couple of things I want you to look at here. Uh, where did these guys evolve them? Where was this lineage evolving? Certainly they are all in Australia, so they have evolved on Australia as well. Africa, Africa yep, and? Which means? Probably. Uh, that would seem to explain why we don't have any in Southeast Asia, even though they are at the same latitude in places like Africa and do well there. Um, but we do have, they're in Mexico and North America only because they've invaded from South America. You can see that what's happening is that this group of animals is invading uh, Mexico from South America. So it's not that they were originally present there. That would be fine, uh, but we think that birds are globally distributed, right? Flyers are probably globally distributed, and the continents were somewhat close together, so it's possible to imagine. Also, by the time these animals appear, probably Gondwana land is breaking up or broken to a degree. So it's not entirely clear what this means. It may mean that things like ostriches and emus were present in places like North America, Europe, and Asia, but went extinct at some point and survived on those other southern uh, islands. But it may also mean that they evolved on Gondwana land um, and that they evolved, therefore, very differently from other modern birds in the way we think of them. Right? So they may have evolved in, that, in a very distinct pattern. This is the Tinnamons. This is uh, this is a group that is a restricted, or I should say, was restricted entirely to South America until the land bridge between North America and connected uh, back up to South America. And at that point, they seem to have migrated from the rainforest in South America up into the rainforest into Central America and have have basically been stuck there since then. These are, again, these are animals that we think of that retain probably a lot of traits like the primitive, uh, primitive basal aves. They are generally ground dwelling uh, to a degree, although they roost at night in trees. They are cryptically colored because everything eats them. They have uh, relatively poor flight characteristics. They can fly and they do so regularly, uh, often at night, uh, or I should say at, at dusk and dawn, either descending from trees or going into trees like turkeys, right? So there's probably, that's probably, you can think of that, probably how, how dinosaurs are evolving this flight axis of back and forth between the ground and the tree where the tree will provide safety at night from maybe things like synapses, right? Primitive mammals that are running around and can pick you off and maybe really characteristically important to be up in a tree where you can get away from that. They are, instead of flying, they often prefer to rely on their cryptic coloration to uh, protect them. So if you approach them, instead of trying to get away from you, they will just remain motionless, right? And they actually, do, this apparently works really well uh, because this animal near a big pile of leaves, you won't, you won't see it until you basically kick the bird out of the way. So they do that. 
Uh, they're often found in forests, like I mentioned. Again, the, another characteristic we think that aves evolved in forests. And they are active, again, active during the day, as we think aves is probably doing. And they, one of the things that's important to note here is, like theropod dinosaurs uh, that are not flyers, they are very, very heavy for their size. So they can still fly, but they're heavy for that size. Most modern birds are much, much lighter for size, and that is useful in flight but it's not useful if you want to spend a lot of time walking around on the ground or you need relatively strong legs. But if you're flying, that's not true. All you need the legs for is to launch, and so you don't want really strong leg musculature that wastes a lot of energy when you're flying around carrying big, heavy motors that you're not using, right? So that's a problem. And this is probably actually uh, a lot like what we think of primitive aves look like to a degree, and this may in fact be living a very similar lifestyle to that. This also, uh, we can talk about their breeding here. Males will often build nests and guard them. And uh, females frequently travel between nests and then lay eggs with multiple males. So each female will lay a few eggs in each nest. That means a male is not guaranteed that the eggs that he has in his nest are ones that he has fertilized, but it does, uh, it does provide a mechanism by which females can disperse uh, the risk associated with eggs because, of course, what's where are they going to be very vulnerable when they're eggs, right? So you're going to see really high mortality again on the eggs. Males usually guard the nests and eggs, and hatching usually takes between two and three weeks. And again, that's probably characteristic of what we think about dinosaurs, uh, that they're on that order of, of taking on the order of a few weeks to hatch. Interestingly, the colors of the eggs are very, very variable. So some species can have eggs that are really bright blue, like robin eggs, and some species may have eggs that are entirely br black, and that's probably crypsis, right? There's probably probably provides some protection. Why a group would have blue, I don't I don't happen to know off the top of my head. Uh, but but to uh, the idea of uh, probably animals behaving like this, right, where animals are making nests, probably maybe even males, right? We saw that over raptor guarding that nest. That may in fact be a male guarding the nest. Females are depositing multiple eggs in that nest and then they're moving to another one. Again, not entirely clear. So just because you see a dinosaur associated with a nest does not guarantee you that that is the female, right? We have many, many birds, and especially basal birds, that actually have males that spend the time guarding the nest as opposed to the females. So just keep that in mind uh, when you look at nests of, of dinosaurs. Males do provide care to the young. Again, this is we, we anticipate this based on the other groups that we've seen. The young are relatively precocial, uh, which means that they are uh, fairly similar to the adult in that way. They are not radically different. And they do, instead of relying on flight, by and large, to escape predators, they are really, really good at running. Right? And so they are good runners in that way. That doesn't actually matter. It turns out that a lot of them get eaten anyway. But the ones that do make it, um, they, they, uh, the mortality on these chicks and eggs is extremely high. So the ones that do make it, again, are, are the successful ones relative to the large number of eggs which are produced. And they mature very, very rapidly, right? Two to three weeks as a, uh, in the egg, and then two to three weeks, and they're mature enough to leave uh, the, the adult male. And again, that is probably not characteristic for dinosaurs, or especially theropods as we thought of them, because it probably took much longer. And so this may be an evolutionary adaptation to one, get you to flight faster, and two, get you out of that mortality window faster. So it's very risky because you need a lot of resources to get through it, but if you can get through it, you get through that window where almost everybody's dying, and if you can just get to the other side, you can drop that mortality rate very, very rapidly. That doesn't mean that birds don't get eaten a lot, but they get eaten a lot less than chicks do in that way. Again, the general ecology for these guys is not dissimilar from what we think that, that basal members uh, would have done. They're omnivorous and they probably eat lots of things, including vegetable matter and insect matter especially. Uh, and they use grit in their gizzard, right? So they don't grind with their teeth. They're using uh, uh, a form of material within the gizzard itself to actually, or a rock within the gizzard itself to actually grind that material, uh, very much in line with what we saw for other dinosaurs. And they be, they're prey items for a lot of things, and that's based on their size. One of the things they also have to do that I just want to remind you about is they have to spend a lot of time cleaning themselves, and that's probably true of theropod dinosaurs. Theropod dinosaurs have to preen regularly, right? You can't just have feathers and not take care of them. It requires a lot of, of care and maintenance to do that, and so probably primitive theropods are also spending a lot of time grooming feathers and, and removing material from them. And these guys use sound for general communication and breeding, and so we can anticipate, and this is 
uh, again, not something that, that we were, would be surprised by, that sound would be also important for many groups of dinosaurs as well. We've seen some that have suggested that, especially among the hadrosaurs, right, that have these very elaborate crests that are probably related to sound generation. Okay, so that is it for these uh, basal AVs. I'm not going to get into the advanced AVs. I just wanted to give you some uh, a look at what looks. What do you look at when you look at the bottom of the tree? How closely are they related to modern di or to, to extinct dinosaurs? We're going to deal with thermoregulation next. So we know, of course, that birds are hot-blooded. I don't use that term, hot-blooded, but uh, of course, the things like alligators and crocodiles are not in that way, and they they are not endothermic. So where do dinosaurs sit along that along that pathway?